one of our pastors, uh, I told him about the upcoming conference and the opportunities, and he said, let me pray for you. And so he laid his hand on me, and he began to pray for me, and he asked that the Lord would, would give me a significant weakening so that I could be significantly used. Well, I went to bed and, and got sick. We got in the car at 4.30 in the morning in Louisville. We'd had three vomits by noon and two more by 4 p.m. We finally got here at 7.30 and there was a car out in the parking lot. Some of you may have seen it. There were two car seats out at the back just sort of drying off. And my son said to me, what are those for? I said, well, somebody's been puking in them all day and they're just drying them out probably. We do these conferences in in the midst of very earthy realities, don't we? Real life doesn't stop when you come to a conference, does it? Nor should it. The kind of spirituality cultivated by a conference ought to be the kind that affects real life. Let me ask you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. 15. And we're going to look at three stories that Jesus told. Three stories that Jesus told from Luke chapter 15. And if you want a sermon title, my sermon title this evening would be The Great Worth of Worthless Men. The Great Worth of worthless, sinful men. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. I'll read the whole chapter. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So, very important so. So, he told them this parable. Actually, he told them three. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost just so. I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or, what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? This is efficacious sweeping. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. It just strikes me as I'm reading that, that there may be children here 
who are on that journey right now and some aunt or some uncle or some parent has got you to be here to listen to this, but right now you're on a journey away from the Lord. God wants to bring you back tonight. He wants you to be His child. He's searching for you. He wants to rejoice over you. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Get him dressed up and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound, but he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and never disobeyed your command. Yet you gave me a young you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours comes who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This word is not only beautiful, but it is God's good and true and holy and inspired word. Let's pray. Father, we come before You and we plead with You that the kind of emotion based on truth that You want to provoke in our hearts through these stories would be provoked in our hearts through these stories. We pray, Lord God, that the shallow understanding of Your salvation that we have would be done away with. We pray, Lord God, for the intimacy that's pictured for us in the Song of Solomon, to be ours all the time. We pray, Lord God, that when we hear Isaiah 53, it would melt our hearts. 
Lord God, we pray that we would not be able to be lukewarm to one piece of Your Scriptures. And Lord, we are far too often. I am far too often more than able to be unmoved by Your truth. Father, we plead with You. We beg of You, Lord God. We beg of You that You would please come and meet with us and that You would revive us and that, Lord God, You would take a sinful man and this sinful tongue and You'd cleanse us and You'd dig out ears for us and You'd cause us to hear Your Word and to love You with all of our hearts. We pray that You would do this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I want to begin tonight by telling you my application. I want to begin this talk by telling you what effect I hope these words will have on your life. What I hope will happen. I believe that God's Word is a Word that makes things happen. I believe that God's Word is a Word that says let there be light and then there is light. And that when God works, speaks in this day and age, then people turn around and they say the light of the Son of God has now shone in our hearts the glory of God. God's Word does things. Amen, beloved? And He doesn't let it return void, does He? And so we ought to be seeking Him as we pray, as we hear these things. Lord, do in me what this Word was meant to have it do in me. And what I long to see happen as I preach this Word is that, here it is generally, then I'll say it specifically, generally, I hope that when we're done here this evening, you will be more like Jesus. Amen? Specifically by that, I mean that I hope you'll have more prostitutes over to your house for dinner. That there would be more drunkards in your life. That you would know more sinners and more tax collectors. That they would be the people you get accused of hanging around with too much. So I'm glad to get together with the brethren and get together with all the Christians and I'm glad to be with them and I hope that we will leave here and not just be with each other, right? Because it is Christ-like to hang out with people who are not Christ-like and to not hang out with people who are not Christ-like is not Christ-like, right? Because Christ was a friend to sinners and tax collectors. This is all over the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Him. Now it's a true fact that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. It's a true fact that the natural man does not submit to the things of God. It is a true fact that people who are not born again do not love Jesus. And it's also a true fact that people who don't love God actually are attracted at times. They actually are attracted at times to Christ-like Christians and to Christ. They were drawing near to Him. The sinners wanted to be closer to Jesus. The religious people did not want to be closer to Jesus. The sinners and the tax collectors were pressing in to get closer. Zacchaeus, in Luke chapter 19, here's this theme again, is climbing a tree to spot this man so that he can get together with him. And when Jesus says, Zacchaeus, tonight I will eat at your house for dinner, Zacchaeus is there. Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 32. Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 32. After this, he went out, Luke 5, 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. This is Matthew, his other name, Levi. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi and sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, 
follow me. Now, being a tax collector was a lucrative profession. So it was not going to be easy on Levi's pocketbook. And Jesus says, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Now, Levi has just put himself out of work. He's now out of a job. So what does he do with all the money that he's made being a tax collector? He throws a dinner party for all the other tax collectors in town. Now here's the problem with this story. You can't get this story. Because one thing about tax collectors hasn't changed in their culture and ours. We still aren't real big on tax collectors. But in this day and age, a tax collector was worse than the crack dealer who was ruining the neighborhood. You see, a tax collector was often a Jewish man who had taken a job under the Romans, and this Jewish man working for the Romans was taking money from the Jews and extorting them. So basically, you've got a guy who's working for the man, working for the man who's oppressing you, and then he's extorting his fellow people, his neighbors, and sucking them dry, getting rid of all their money and putting it in his pockets. So these guys weren't popular. And a whole room full of them was especially unpopular. And so Levi's out of a job, And he says, what am I going to do? And he says, I'm going to gather all my tax collector buddies and I'm going to have them over. And and he says, Jesus, will you come over? And Jesus says, no, I'm separate from sin. Is that what Jesus said? No, Jesus was more than happy to recline at table with scandalous sinners. And Levi made him a great feast, verse 29, in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Do you see why I want to see more sinners in my home and more sinners in your home? Do you see why I would front load the application and say, listen, if we're here because we're worshiping Jesus and we're here to know Christ, then Christ-likeness means there will be more drunkards, there will be more prostitutes, there will be more women who are wearing clothes you would never let your daughter wear sitting at your table, hearing the Gospel. Hearing redemption. Because that is where they belong. That's Christ-likeness. You see, the Pharisees of Jesus' day had developed a theology that was all about separation. If you were going to be holy, you had to wash all the sin off of you. You had to get yourself separate from sinners. You couldn't be with the Gentiles. You didn't want to be with the prostitutes. You didn't want to be with the drunkards. And their whole theology of holiness meant you got away from the sinners. The problem is God's definition of holiness means you get away from the sin. And you go after the sinners. You invite them over for dinner. And then you don't get drunk with them. Luke chapter 7, verse 34. We're just overviewing this theme before we land on these three stories. In Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 7, verse 34. Here's the reputation Jesus got during His lifetime. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at Him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. I love this verse. Here's why I love this verse. Jesus is hanging out with Drunkards and tax collectors, how often? Enough so it can get mentioned in the Bible once? No, he's doing it so often that he has a reputation. He has a reputation. How close is he to the drunkard? So close that they think he's a drunkard. Is he a drunkard? No, not at all. Never 
once drunk, but always filled with the Spirit. Always with sinners, never in sin. But He's with them to the point where people have got Him so... Oh, imagine this. Well, they've got Him identified with sinners. That sounds like something Jesus would do, isn't it? Identify with sinners? That's what He's doing. And so you think, how's he going to justify himself? How is he going to, how is he going to say it's okay that I hang out with drunkards? It's okay that I hang out with immoral women? And it's okay that I hang out with prostitutes and tax collectors? How am I going to justify that? And it says, wisdom is justified by her children. Well, it's just great to see prostitutes born again. You want justification for why I hang out with immoral people? It's incredible to see them saved. And Phariseeism sure isn't changing their lives. Henry Ironside, the preacher of this last century, at one time was challenged by an atheist. Uh, uh, basically was being challenged on his beliefs by an atheist. And Henry Ironside to him said, listen, tomorrow you bring a hundred people who have been radically transformed by the life-changing message of atheism, and I'll bring you a hundred people who have been transformed by the life-saving message of Christ. Well, the atheist couldn't bring ten. Harry Ironside had a hundred ready the next day. Wisdom is justified by her children. Some of the young people, I can hear this playing out now in a kitchen about four days from now. Mom, I want to go hang out with these ungodly, immoral people. Because that preacher at the fellowship conference said it would be good for me to do this. Make sure you're going to be like Jesus. Luke 14. Jesus is with... Si- is it Simon? Let me go to Luke 14 before I start quoting things. Remember, I'm still working on Jesus wept. Luke 14. You know what Jesus does when He's with sinners? He does not hang out with sinners and see how close He can get to drunk And how cool he can sound, hoping that maybe they'll then ask him about him. That's not his way. Here's Jesus at a dinner party. Luke 14. One Sabbath, when they went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. He's under scrutiny. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it not lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a, on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. So, starts off on the Sabbath day and says, What should I do on the Sabbath day? I think I'll give them a little gospel offense. I'm going to heal on the Sabbath day. And expose their legalism. Then he's at a party, verse 7, And he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by them. Now catch this. What is this? This is Jesus hanging out with sinners. He's watching everyone. They're maneuvering for the best seat in the house. They want to sit by the guests. They want to have the most important conversations. So Jesus decides He'll discuss the wickedness of doing just that. Jesus was among the worst of the worst, but not to wink at their sins, but to deal with it directly and to call them to repentance. Holiness and deep engagement with people who are still deeply sinful are not opposites. Holiness to God means you go into the midst of the people that Jesus walked in the midst of and you shun the wickedness of their lives and lovingly call them to the Savior. So my application tonight, my application tonight is that I want to see more drunkards, more sinners, more tax collectors, more prostitutes in my, head, in my house, sitting here in my living room. And I, I love the thought of five or six hundred kitchens and living rooms 
filled with more and more sinners being faithful, preaching the Gospel, seeing people saved. Amen? Amen. Listen, Christian parenting does not... Listen, you have not succeeded as a Christian parent when your kids come home late on Saturday night and you say to them, what were you doing? And they say, we were watching Little House reruns. That's not success. Success is when they come home and say, we were with prostitutes, tax collectors, drunkards, gluttons, widows. We were with the immoral, being holy in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, holding forth the word of life. That's when you say, praise God! You did something through my parenting. But the church is inclined the other way, isn't it? There is a sinful tendency that arises within the institutional church that goes the other way. In 1739, the Church of England had become so inhospitable to the common man that John Wesley had to take to the graveyards and fields to preach the Gospel. And what did he see? He preached sometimes to 30,000 people, coal miners with tears streaming down their eyes. And he saw them saved. According to R. Kent Hughes, tragically a mere hundred years later, Methodist William Booth noticed that the poorest and most degraded were never in church. And Richard Collier tells in a time of Booth's life where he barged into the Episcopal Methodist Church on Broad Street and there was Samuel Dunn, the minister, seated on a plush red throne and the people were singing, Foul I to thy fountain fly. Wash me or I save your do- die. And the door swung open and willful will, William Booth began to push in the raggedy people of London or the raggedy people of England into the, the Episcopal church and to press them in. Because the church ought to be when she's walking by the Spirit. A place where tax collectors and sinners and the outcasts and the defiled are welcome. It's hard, isn't it? I was saved 16 years ago Thursday. And I've spent a lot of my time as a Christian in Bible colleges, seminaries, seminary, church, prayer meetings. All good things. Nothing we should get rid of. But it's interesting though, isn't it? The longer you're a Christian, the more removed you become from those who do not know the Lord. And the more intentionality it takes. The more intentionality it takes. Good resolves are good. Paul prays that you would make good on every resolve for good by the Holy Spirit. And it takes those resolves, doesn't it? To go out and to walk into the streets of a neighborhood you're scared of. To invite a friend over from work that you know is going to say, well, it's going to say things in front of your kids you would prefer not be said in front of your kids. I would argue that to hear, for your kids to hear those things in the context of you sharing the Gospel is tremendous Christian training. I love the story of the biker who came to church and when he was done said, that was a hell of a sermon, preacher. We ought to love to see those sort of baby steps on the way into the kingdom. So how do I, as a preacher, how does the Word of God, as the Word that shapes us, how does, that, how does it move us now? Toward that application? How does it move us towards a Christianity that can drift towards Phariseeism? That can drift away from just separating yourself from sin and drift into separating yourself from sinners? How would the Word of God move the 500 people in front of me more deeply into the lives of outcasts, drunkards, tax collectors, prostitutes, Pharisees even? How would the Word of God do that? 
And I believe these three stories, the truths they contain, have power which can be used by the Holy Spirit to move us. Look at how the stories are told. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Him. Verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. They're scandalized. This ought to discredit him immediately. So he told them this parable. These stories are to explain why he does what he does. These stories are to show you the heart of God for sinners. These stories are to show you the tremendous worth of worthless men that it makes it worth leaving the respectable to go out and get the sinners. That's what these stories were meant to do in the Pharisees' lives. And that's what they're meant to do in our lives if we see any remaining Pharisaical tendencies. These stories show us the heart of God by telling us the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. So let's just walk through these stories simply. I hope clearly. And then after we've walked through them, we will look at the great worth of worthless men and why it moves the Son of God. Why it moves the heart of the Father to press out and to seek them until they are found. First, there's five elements in these stories. Five elements in these stories. First, there's always a pursuer. There's always a pursuer. First pursuer is the shepherd. Chapter 15, verse 4. So he told them this parable, what man of you having a hundred sheep? There's this shepherd. There's a man with a hundred sheep. And then there is a woman. Chapter 15, verse 8. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp. There's a woman. And then in the third story, there is a father. And he said there was a man who had two sons. And so we have three stories and three stories that show us a pursuer. A shepherd, a woman, and a father. And very plainly, you don't need a PhD for this one. All the pursuers represent God, don't they? They show us God. They show us, you can say they show us Jesus. You can say they show us God the Father. It doesn't matter. Anyone who's seen Jesus has seen the Father. And they show us the heart of God for lost sinners. In each of these stories, there's not only a pursuer, but there is the lost. There's a lost sheep. There is a lost coin. And there is a lost son. And as someone has pointed out, there's a hundred sheep. And there's ten coins. And just two sons. And there's a sort of increasing value in the stories. Third thing there is in all these stories is not just a pursuer, not just the lost, but there is the pursuit. The shepherd leaves the 99. Look at verse 3. So he told them this parable, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. So there's a leaving and a pursuing and a going after. Not just so you can say you looked. So you got kids? Do that? Go find my baseball cap. I couldn't find it. Did you look? Yeah, I looked. Go look until you find it. Look under things and over things and through things and lift things up and do everything it takes until you find it. That's what God does. He does everything it takes. Can you imagine if God did such a pitiful salvation? Well, I tried to save them. Who would have come? Who would have come? No, He goes out and He does everything He has to do until He has you. And then He throws you over His arms and He takes you into the fold. 
There's always a pursuit. The shepherd leaves the 99. The woman sweeps the house looking. Or what woman? Having ten silver coins. If she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. Now remember, a coin was like a day's wage. So this, was like, this wasn't like some spare change dropped into your couch while you're eating popcorn on the couch. This wasn't like this. This was like you lost your paycheck for that day. What woman, when she realizes the paycheck is gone, doesn't sweep everything, light oil, even though that costs money, to do everything it takes to find that lost coin. And then finally, there's the father who pursues the son. It's a little harder to see in this story. It's in verse 20. It's a little harder to see because the son, unlike a coin and a sheep, actually makes some motions towards the father. He's repenting. But we see in verse 20 that the father is eager to seek the son. Verse 20, And while the son arose, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. It's almost like, you can't get near my house and me not be watching for you. And he saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And so we see again the pursuer, the lost, and the pursuit. Now this is my favorite. I almost spent all night preaching on this one, but we'll condense it into this little thing. The fourth element of this story is the celebration. This is a celebration. And if uh, you're a Baptist like I am, you'll just need to repent by the time you're done. Because there is no excuse for not dancing once you've read this. Verse 5. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Notice, nobody's around. The shepherd's rejoicing. Not just, you know, some people, they're always happy when you're with them, but then they get alone and they're depressed or they come to the, count, the pastor because they're suicidal. But when they're with people, they're always happy. No, the shepherd is happy to have found the sheep when he's alone. And when he comes home, Verse 6, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So the shepherd coming home, I found the sheep, is a picture of what's happening in heaven when one lost sinner is saved. Amen? And then, this woman. Now this one's amazing. Verse 9. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Joy where? Joy where? Where? What does the, no, the text say? Before the angels of God. So we're not talking about the joy of the angels, although that's important. We're talking about the joy in front of the angels. Who's that? That's God! God's singing and praising and dancing in front of the angels! God's singing with loud singing in front of the angels. Why do angels covered with eyes never close their eyes and always stare at God? Because they're blown away by the rejoicing, celebrating, almighty, holy, rainbow around His head, lightning around His throne, God who rejoices when He sees sinners saved. Amen. Some people who get into Reformed theology can't ever rejoice when anyone gets saved. Like there's got to be a 75-day test 
before anyone gets any rejoicing. And then at the end of 75 days, like, well, okay. I think I'm okay with this now. Preach a biblical gospel. Preach biblical repentance. Preach the cross of Christ. And when they come, throw a party. Amen. We had a Catholic woman get saved just two, three weeks ago. Her husband had saved, been saved about two years ago. And he began to live with her. She was not at all impressed that he'd been converted. At all. She did not make his life sweet at all when he got converted. But after this January, she said, can I have a Bible? And then she started listening to all kinds of sermons online. And last couple weeks ago, she was in my office as we prepared for baptism going, so uh, do you organize the party? Catholics have parties when they get baptized. I'm thinking to myself, we should. Someone ought to organize a party. So we baptized her and then we went to the park and had a party. She organized it. There's the pursuer, the lost, the pursuit, celebration, and the self-righteous. The self-righteous. Jesus says in verse 7, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, this verse gets taken wrong. What do you think Jesus is saying here? There's actually 99 people out of 100 who don't need to repent? Like there'll be 100 people in heaven and they'll be like, hey, did Jesus party over you? No, not over me. He just knows over the repentance which I had just lived a righteous life. He's mocking the Pharisees. He's mocking them. Many, many sinners need compassion. Many, many sinners need sweetness. And some sinners need mocking. And Pharisees are those kinds of sinners. Legalistic religion is the religion which Scripture holds out its harshest words for. There will be more joy in heaven over one of these prostitutes that gets into heaven from having a meal with me and believing in me than all the 99 of you who are working your way to heaven. Amen. In the second story, the self-righteous are not actually explicitly mentioned. But we know they're in the background because of verse... Two, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And in the third story, the self righteous are there again. Look at verse 27. Verse 27. And the older brother comes. Oh, I, I, I forgot I didn't mention why the older brother came. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So it's, it's coming out of the house. We had a college party house across the street from us. And it was, they liked us because we had a church parking lot for them to park in. So they could get like 300 people in one house. And the house would do this. you know. <laughs> and at 3 in the morning I'd wake up and they'd all be coming out and getting in their cars. You can see a party when it's in a house, can't you? I mean, the music comes out. It spills out into the street. The older brother sees a party. Somebody's eating fat and calf in there. And it says, and he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And he doesn't say, let's go party. He's mad. Legalists are always mad at grace. If you see someone get grace and it makes you mad, there's a legalistic bone in your body. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. This sounds like Paul. According to the law, blameless. 
Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him, he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. God answers the self-righteous by saying, you should be rejoicing in a transformation from death to life, from being lost to found. Those are the five elements of the story. The pursuer, the lost, the pursuit, the celebration, the self-righteous. And it's my belief that if you understand the core of this story, there will be more drunkards in your house in the coming months. More prostitutes will be your friends. More sinners will find a refuge in your home. Your life will look different six months from now. I haven't been a pastor nearly as long as some of the men here. But after about, I guess, ministry maybe 12 years, something like that. I have very little sense of what's happened after a meeting or a counseling session or a conference. I want to know what's happened six months out. So I pray there's a tremendous awakening in the soul today, and I'll praise and celebrate for that, and I pray that in six months, the dinner tables in this room look different. The time allocation. We just finished, we just scrapped the way we were doing church at Emmanuel so that we could make more time to free our people up to get involved in the lives of sinners, and it's been amazing. The thing you need to know and understand to understand these five elements of the story, to understand these three stories, to understand how these things moved Jesus out into company that was not like heaven. The things you need to know, or the thing that I think drives these stories, is the value of lost sinners. And I'll be honest with you, I I wasn't sure that was right the first time I studied this passage. I haven't got a theology that places a lot of emphasis on the value of lost sinners. And neither do you. And maybe that's why they're not in our homes. It may be because there's something wrong with our theology. Notice that all three things being pursued are objects of value. A sheep, wool, meat, sacrifice. It was a valuable animal. Now I know that's hard to understand for a Kroger generation where we get all of our meat pre-ground and our clothes don't have any real fibers in them anyway. But a sheep with its wool and with its meat and its potential to be offered as a sacrifice pleasing to the Lord was a valuable animal. And so the Lord uses a picture of value to represent lost sinners. And then a coin. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? A coin is valuable. Money is valuable. You need money to make it through this world. Some say, no you don't. You can rely on the Lord. Yeah, and when you do, what He does, He answers your prayer by giving you the money you need to make it through this world. And He chooses money, an object of value, to represent lost sinners. And then finally, a son. What could be more valuable than a son. David's heart is struck and cries, Absalom, my son, 
my son, and how many people throughout the history of the world, Christian and non-Christian, have not treasured and recognized the value of a son. Now, I love my daughter. But this picture here tells us the value, not more value, but the value of a son. Notice, Jesus did not tell the parables of the lost dust ball, the lost piece of dirt, and the extra lint that nobody could find. That is not what lost Christians are. They are people of value. A sheep. A coin. A son. And notice the way these stories turn. You've got you to watch the way Jesus is arguing with your soul. Watch the way these stories turn. Verse 4 of chapter 15. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country? This is not spiritual logic, people. This is common sense. What shepherd leaves a sheep? Nobody. No shepherd in his right mind says, oh, I can just lose one or two here and there. They are of value. Verse 8. Or what woman having ten silver coins? Do you, do you see this? I want you to notice this. It's, it's what woman? Any woman. There's, there's not a woman alive. What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? This is the way women work. This is the way shepherds work. What father does not want to be reunited with his son? I remember watching the Chilean miners down for what was it, over two months? Down in the pit of the earth. And I stayed up late the night they got out. And they were raising them up one by one. And the, the, of course, the reporters are all looking for that, that human angle, that, that story that's going to catch your attention. And they began to tell the story of the two brothers that were down in the mine. And they said, one of the f boys is alienated from his father. Estranged from his father. And they began to raise that boy up, up to the top of the earth where he was going to be up. But he was alienated from father. So he was going to come up onto the earth after being down in the ground for over two months and have estrangement from his father. But as this is happening, they catch someone in the crowd. Someone is jostling the crowd and moving through the crowd and pressing in to where this boy is going to come up. Who is it? It's the father. The father wanted to be reunited with his son. All of a sudden, the reasons for estrangement were gone. This doesn't require spiritual discernment. What man doesn't want to be reunited with his father? What son doesn't wish he had a better relationship with his father? Do you, do you fall, you've got to catch the logic. Jesus is trying to say to you, here it is. Everybody would go after something they see of value. What's the problem then? The Pharisees don't see sinners as people of value. That's the problem. They think one lost sheep is no big deal. They think one lost coin is no big deal. They think a son gone astray is no big deal. They are spiritually mad. And so are we. To the degree that we do not understand the value and the desire to be reunited with and the desire to get the coin back in the pocket and the sheep back on the shoulders and the son back in the home. Do you see the logic of the Lord Jesus Christ? These are items of value. A sheep, a coin, a son. And the logic brings this out. Who wouldn't go after them? Who wouldn't? Now this is shocking since the Bible often emphasizes the worthlessness of man. Isn't it? I'm not immediately comfortable talking like this. The value of sinners. 
funny is I've been running my sermon title by people over the course of the weekend. They sort of give me a blank stare. You're going to preach that here? Do you know where you are? We don't believe in the value. Romans chapter 3 makes it clear that sinners are worthless, doesn't it? Romans chapter 3. says this, it says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. Not worthy, worthless. Ephesians chapter 2 says sinners are dead and their trespasses in. Luke 15 says they're dead. So how do we reconcile the worthlessness of sinners and the worthiness of sinners? The, the, the worthlessness of sinners and the value of sinners. And I promise you, it's because we don't understand these two things that the sinners aren't in our homes. Anytime you've got a defect in practice, you've got a defect in theology. Amen? <clears throat> How do you bring these things together? Here's my best attempt. Though the Bible teaches that we are morally wicked and morally worthless, no, nonetheless, no matter how far we have fallen, the Scriptures never forget that we were made in the image of God. Genesis 1 says, Let man be made in My image. Image. You can kill a million people. You can become a mass murderer. You can become a Hitler. You can become the most degraded pedophile. You can become the meanest dad. You can become the most tyrannical hypocrite or the darkest Pharisee, but you cannot strip yourself of being made in the precious precious, precious, inestimable image of God. You can think like God. You can reason like God. Your very body can display the characteristics of God. You can run after a son like a father. Like God. You can search for a coin. Like God. Who you are was made to reflect the glory of God. And you've become worthless in that you use that so poorly. You've become worthless in that you do not respond to God. But who you are, made in the image of God, can never be stripped away. And the Bible affirms in Genesis 9 that we're still made in the image of God. It affirms in James chapter 3 that we should not curse men who are made in the image of God. There is a value and a preciousness to everyone made in the image of God. Listen to the way the, the Bible reasons with human beings. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 35. And I'm going to start working out some implications, and then I'll close. Kids, don't get too hopeful. That's, that's not coming too quickly, but... It is coming. <clears throat> Whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Listen to the reasoning of Jesus. Jesus. What does it profit a man to what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? How valuable is your soul? You were made with a soul. You are a soul. 
You were made in the image of God, able to commune with God. You are now an eternal being. You didn't begin an eternal being like God, but from the minute you were conceived, there will never be a moment in all of eternity where you are not. It just blows me away when I go and visit parents in the hospital with newborn babies. You're like, this person will be forever somewhere. And what would it profit them to get Asia and um, the Americas and all the treasures of Europe and everything in every castle? And what if all 7 billion people on the planet looked at them one day and said, you're amazing. We think you're great. All your opinions are amazing. And they lost their soul. Everything in the world is nothing compared to one soul. That's a coin. That's a sheep. That's a son. That's value that comes from the image of God in a man. This should be a helpful corrective in our age, right? This should be a helpful corrective in our age. We live in a weird age. Here's the way the thinking of our age goes. It goes like this. There once was a very constipated piece of mass somewhere, and it was like all this stuff pressed together really, really firmly. And then there was a big bang. And you are the diarrhea of the universe. Having evolved from the explosion of mass billions and billions of years ago. And because of that, you ought to have tremendous self-esteem. That's not rational. Try as they might, no one acts like an accident. Try as they might, no one acts like they're worthless. Try as they might, no one thinks that they are just random nothingness. We all have a deep sense, a deep sense that we were made to worship God. That's deep. It can't be erased, Romans 1. And so we ought to be saying in the middle of this crazy age, no, man is not the product of a big explosion and then a big crapshoot and then a big random History that now makes him nothing that should have a self-esteem. That's not man. Man is fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. But if you say that, won't people get proud? No. Because then you go on and tell them the rest of the story. And that's that though he was dignified and put in a garden, though he was meant to rule this world for God, though he was meant to live like the Lord Jesus himself, He's done nothing but sin. Disobey God. Offend God. Unless you understand the value of man, you can't understand sin. Man has to be dignified before his insult to God is worth anything. When a lint dust piece, if, if this fern were to call me an idiot, I would not care. But if you were to call me an idiot, I would spend all night thinking about how wrong you were. Or in a more spiritual moment, I might receive your correction. In order for a person to insult anyone, they must be a person of dignity. They must be worth something. The horror of sin 
is that a man who was given reason by God and creativity by God and was given a heart full of emotions by God, that this very same man has chosen to ignore God and to enjoy his place in the world without God and to insult God and to blaspheme God and to nail God to a cross. This is the horror of sin. And the glory of the cross is that Jesus came as a dignified man living in pure dignity and holiness and righteousness. And He died on a cross for worthless, worthy sinners and shed His own blood for them. You've got to understand the worth of man before you really understand the Gospel. A few little things. And then I'll close. This should shape the way you speak to those who have been sexually abused. There are people whose lives, actually one out of every three women apparently, experience some kind of sexual abuse. It's one pastor's forecast. And when you just walk into a life like that with no explanation and start going, you're trash, you're worthless, you're garbage, they're not hearing what you'll hope they'll hear. You've got to start with you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You were made in the image of God. You may have been being raped since you were two, but you're a coin. You're a sheep. You're a son. And the way you've responded to all that abuse has been sinful too, hasn't it? It has. And you've become worthless. And you too have become part of the sin problem that you hate so much. And you need the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's going to sweep the room until He gets you. This should shape what we mean when we say God-centered. There's a buzzword. I like God-glorifying, God-centered theology. And me too. That always involves people. It doesn't mean like you just run around sprinkling Gospel tracts on people you don't care about. It doesn't mean you just speak to people in a louder voice, hoping that if you speak in a louder voice, they'll just become new creations. It means you reason and care for and invite over for dinner. Lost coins, lost sheep, and lost sons. Because when they get saved, the image of God is restored in that coin, and that sheep, and that son. And you know what happens when sons who become sons of the devil, become sons of God through Christ. You know what what happens when that happens to millions of people? The earth becomes filled with the knowledge of the glory of God like the waters cover the sea. That's what it is when a lot of people come back to their senses and realize they were made by God and they should repent to God and they need to seek forgiveness from God and they have been forgiven by God. That's God-centered. And it cares for people. It cares for people. Are you with me? Finally, this should drive us to evangelism and missions, right? This should create a holy discontent until you know more drunkards and tax lawyers. I mean, If a girl walks into your church and she's all tatted up and got the big hoop piercings and you can't think of another conversation starter other than what homeschooling material have you decided to use this year? You're not going to go very far. I find in the neighborhood in which I minister, you can't even ask people, what do you do for a living? That one's a bad one. They don't do anything for a living. Who are you? Who you know in the neighborhood? How'd you find out about the church? You're going to need to think as a church and as churches about how do we become more welcoming? 
Not because you're seeker sensitive, but because you love God. It's like there's this, there's this thought in the Reformed community that getting sensible and practical about how to welcome in sinners is compromise. That's not compromise. That's wisdom driven by love. So critique each other. Sharpen each other. What do we do? What are we going to do to be welcoming to sinners? What are we going to do to get them into our lives? What are we going to drop? What are we going to make happen so that sinners are around our kitchen tables, in our dining rooms, so that we've got our reputation? Is that a Reformed church? No, I think they're drunk! Wouldn't that be an amazing reputation to have? Especially if it was completely untrue. Completely untrue. I want to be lied about the way Jesus was lied about. Well, I guess, I guess the application just goes like this. If you believe humans are valuable because they're made in the image of God, if you believe that they are lost coins, lost sheep, and lost sons? Well, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't go after them? Who wouldn't? You understand this deal? Who wouldn't? If you believe it, who wouldn't? Let's pray. Lord God, make it completely irrational for us not to seek sinners. Lord, forgive us for caring only for the brethren. We are to give a special care to the brethren. We can't help but give a special care to the brethren. Your Spirit in us makes us love the brethren. But Lord, Your Spirit in us makes us love the lost. Lord, we pray that we would see the value of those who are degrading You. And we would be moved to love them more. And I pray that You would transform my life and our lives so that if we meet again next year, there's all kinds of new stories about who we've been seeking to fellowship with. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.